Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. Hello, in this episode of Udacast, I'm talking with an old friend and associate and comrade, uh, Lewis Shepard of VMware. Uh, Lewis, let me give uh, people my version of your bio, if that's okay, Absolutely. and then you can correct the record. Um, I, I met Lewis probably in uh, 2003 or 2004. Um, you had gotten the call to service after the horrific events of 2001, 9-11, um, and had been working very successfully in Silicon Valley, uh, helping create and drive innovation there, and um, you know, came into the national security space where you had some background um, previously, and uh, then began working at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, of course, I'd been in the intel world for a while and had several friends there, and eventually I was pulled back into the Defense Intelligence Agency, where we both served together, um, helping to bring advanced technologies into that important mission set. Um, after we both uh, left DIA, um, we've, I've still followed you closely, of course, and uh, watched as right. you uh, create, created uh, new capabilities and brought the very best of R&D from uh, the commercial world into you know, government use, and you're now serving both worlds today. You're uh, helping VMware uh, steer their R&D investments to make sure that they are creating the right thing. You're helping government decision makers think through what's the realm of the possible and all sorts of strategic places. Is, uh, is that good for a brief bio? What kind of things that I miss there, Lewis? No, very much. Uh, I, I'll only uh, underline that I began life as a outside of technology um, as a political scientist. Um, that's what my graduate work was in, and I uh, therefore um, was able to perhaps think a little bit differently from uh, people who came up purely learning coding and development. And so I think it's a happy marriage. Uh, I like to think. Um, to be understanding the human side and the social side and the uh, relevant uh, governmental implications of the kinds of technologies that we uh, we develop and use now. Uh, I got more technical, uh, you know, the older I got, I was always an early adopter and uh, I learned to code and, and so forth. But, uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm pretty comfortable uh, on both sides of that fence, which I think is really important. Uh, not only in government, but elsewhere, so that we always have a nice human-centric understanding of the implications of the technologies we build and deploy. All right. We were just talking with um, another uh, OODA Loop member, Dan Gierstein, who was, called himself an accidental technologist, as he described his career. And um, I thought, you know, that kind of applies to me, too. And now hearing you describe that, maybe it's a bit of that way for you as well. You get pulled into this, and you find you can make a difference, and you keep making a difference. Yeah, and I don't want to discount the people who have made that same transition in reverse, because there are many, many examples of uh, uh, great people who were um, hardcore technologists, hardcore computer scientists, for example, um, or other uh, technical disciplines who have come to play a really important public policy role or advisory role in, in public affairs and and other aspects of the human uses. So. Um, uh, that's, I think, a, a, a great, um, uh, a, a, it's a, it, you know, we talk about seamless un, um, uh, in deploying technologies. This is one where the seam should be actually recognized and celebrated in a way, because otherwise you're never going to explicitly try to uh, recruit people from the other side of the fence from you and, um, and to actually understand the imperatives from, from either side. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it's also, I mean, it's just, it's critical in this current time of crisis. And we see case after case after case where some policymakers have no understanding of technology or science, and we're all paying a price for that. But you see these other champions who have excelled in science and their discipline, like uh, Dr. Fauci, for example, mm -hmm. who is informing policymakers with smart, fact-based um, opinions and assessments that are helping do the right thing. Mm -hmm. so I think we need yeah. to do that. Well, and I think uh, one of the things I've uh, always used as a, um, as a, a teaching uh, 
uh, element in my thinking about this, the role of technology in, uh, in government and public policy has been our experience with that very question you're bringing up um, in the nuclear era, the earliest atomic era. So we had uh, hardcore physicists like uh, Albert Einstein, Robert Oppenheimer, who had very developed thinking on the human and social implications of the technologies that they were involved in uh, in sparking and um, their views were um, were often um, discounted uh, you know Einstein maybe less so Oppenheimer more so uh, their views on uh, the social and human and public um, implications of the technologies they had developed and I think uh, we need to um, keep our minds open to the relevance of the views of those who, unlike me, um, actually uh, came up from a purely scientific uh, discipline. All right. Lewis, I do want to ask you a few questions about the current crisis, and then I really want to talk to you about your views on the future of technology, including how it may have been uh, impacted by the current crisis, but also where it's going regardless, whatever we do. Uh, but starting with this current pandemic, there's a lot of info out there, a lot of uh, good info, a lot of specious info. It's, it's info overload, and it's like we're asking every citizen to be an intel analyst uh, with this overwhelming onslaught of information from every source, books, radios, videos, TVs, um, Twitter, Facebook. Um, how is a person supposed to find the best sources? And maybe the way I should ask that is, what sources do you uh, tap into uh, for trusted information on this pandemic? It's it's a tough challenge uh, to be uh, to be fair and to be honest because um, um, well let me put it this way the positive uh, aspect of this and to answer the question um, I think we need to realize that at the same time that there has been an explosion of new sources and a uh, you know, now a vast array of, of um, information sources available to everybody at the touch of their phone. Um, at the same time, there still continue to be what uh, fully existed um, before the internet era, and that is um, a wealth of trusted, branded, curated sources of news, edited sources of news. So, uh, you know, the I, I have a lot of uh, respect for the role of editor. I, in college, I worked as a lowly copy editor on the University of Virginia um, student newspaper. Smartest person on campus, uh, in my mind, was the editor of that paper. Um, and he, you know, corrected a million mistakes that I made. Um, editors play a really important role in the scenario you're talking about. We have so much information available. So I like news sources that have a strong tradition of editorial um, excellence. Now, the world of journalism, uh, that, that hasn't extended over into social media yet. I know that Facebook has hired uh, several thousand human editors at the same time as trying to develop and deploy um, machine learning uh, techniques to be able to curate and edit. Uh, the profusion of uh, not just news sources, but user generated content that go into Facebook sites. But in no way does that match the, the, the deft and polished and practiced and experienced eye of a human editor on a source like the New York Times. So I'll mention the New York Times. Um, it's, uh, you know, long been seen for almost 100 years as the nation's preeminent uh, print news source. I live in rural Essex County, Virginia. I'm the only subscriber, my wife and I, the only subscribers to the print edition of the New York Times in our county. And thank goodness for the, uh, the woman who uh, delivers that paper at 5.30 every morning to my doorstep. I still read the print New York Times every single day, seven days a week. And I learn a lot more about a lot of unexpected things because I've used every digital format of every newspaper I can find. And I've never found one. Some of them do really innovative stuff. Washington Post, I'm a digital subscriber to the Washington Post. I love, I know their uh, CTO 
and he does a wonderful job with innovative stuff, both on the, uh, the mobile version and the desktop version, still doesn't match the experience and the, um, uh, the, the ability to absorb a lot of information in a short amount of time uh, that uh, reading a print newspaper does. Now, um, so sources like the New York Times and, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty of the web is I can read the New England Journal of Medicine online when I never could read the New England Journal of Medicine before. Um, so in a pandemic, the medical and health and uh, academic research sources uh, become uh, invaluable. Uh, I'll get back to social media in a second here, but one of the things that I noticed about the New York Times is, so they have a very large digitally aware and very proficient staff uh, who focus on information visualization because they're trying to uh, both handle complex topics in a way that uh, are very uh, amenable for their readers and also to deal with increasingly new generations of readers who are used to consuming uh, information in much more nimble, agile, vis uh, visual ways. And so here's an example. On March 22nd, of, and we're filming this on March 31st, so you know, uh, just a week ago, March 22nd, a little over a week ago, the Times posted online, so I saw it online, um, a phenomenal information visualization spread about uh, the uh, birth of the, uh, the, the novel coronavirus in uh, Wuhan, China, mm -hmm. and the spread of it across China, and the spread of it then internationally. And it is a series of just um, insanely helpful and uh, compelling data visualizations done in a really um, uh, interesting and, and uh, um, uh, just fantastic way. Mm -hmm. Conveyed a lot of information, uh, did it in a, a really uh, dynamic and moving way. As I looked at that, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. Thank goodness I, I look at the digital version every now and then uh, as well. Uh, that was on the 22nd. Three days later on the 25th, I open up my uh, print New York Times and on uh, two three interior pages spread across three uh, pages of newsprint were really well done uh, translations of that dynamic online digital um, uh, information into print graphics, uh, which of course were static. Uh, they were colorized, but the, uh, you know, the majority was black and white. It took a lot of thinking on how to do that. They got the same message across um, and pretty much um, it's valuable to look at both. Uh, but, uh, you know, that version uh, in the print paper was accompanied by inches and inches and inches of columns of phenomenal uh, reporting and so forth. So I like to rely on the tried and true uh, sources like that. But um, you know, one thing that our conversation here reminds me of is, so you at OODA Loop, uh, Bob, you and your team, you uh, uh, up and until uh, our quarantine era here, you've been holding conferences and hosting face-to-face real-time uh, meetings uh, uh, for large audiences. Large audiences are great. We're all now getting used to uh, more and more events being um, performed um, uh, virtually. So we have a great wealth of choices of online conferences, video-driven conferences that we can consume. One that I'll pitch because, uh, again, it answers your question, is uh, tomorrow, as, as we're recording this, and wait, you're going to be posting this later. One that I'll encourage people to look, find back online and uh, look at because I know it's going to be posted uh, immediately after it's uh, filmed on April 1st is at the Stanford Institute uh, for uh, Human-Centric Artificial Intelligence, which goes by the acronym of HAI at Stanford. Stanford University established uh, this Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, a novel uh, combination of what we were talking about before, about the blending of, uh, of uh, disciplines and backgrounds. So there's going to be an all day conference uh, and people can uh, check out the videos of it. Um, 
I saw you tweeting about that, Lewis. So yeah. anybody wants more info can find you on Twitter, right? You've got a link to it in your Twitter feed. Absolutely. And I think the virtue of it, the value of it is uh, the Institute itself is led by two people uh, on the Stanford faculty. Uh, one is Fei Fei Lin, who, of course, is a, a phenomenal computer scientist, uh, has also uh, at times been with uh, uh, Google, leading Google's AI research. Uh, she's back full time, I believe, on the uh, Stanford faculty. But uh, her partner in it is John Etchemendi, a longtime, highly renowned Stanford uh, philosopher, professor of philosophy. And it's that kind of blend that gives it the, the human centric AI aspect. And then you mentioned Twitter. Uh, I'll admit that, like Bob Gorley, perhaps second only to Bob Gorley, I'm a Twitter addict. Um, I use lists a lot on Twitter. So I have probably um, two dozen active lists that I curate. Um, some have very few members, they're really selective. Um, and those lists are uh, maybe four or five accounts that I wanna be able to see on a particular topic all at once, if I wanna focus on that. Um, I have a, a list on, you know, on US politics, which has probably 200 political reporters, political activists, uh, officials, government people, elected officials, public policy people. I have one on China. I have one on Russia. I have several on uh, artificial intelligence, several others on other kinds of technologies. Curated lists in Twitter are a feature that I don't see um, on Facebook, the ability to do anything like that uh, successfully, where I, as just an anonymous user, can actually uh, uh, curate a set of accounts and, and follow them as a group. Um, and I, I find that to be an extraordinarily helpful um, research and news consumption uh, tool for me. And I encourage people to use that. You can really gain control over the swamp, the morass, the, the tidal wave of misinformation. Are your lists uh, public or private? Uh, they are 100% private right now, but I'd be happy to unlock a few of them. Too. See, well, I, I use a mix. Some of mine, I just have a bunch of public lists that have been out there for a long time. Others, I intentionally wanted to keep secret because I thought it's nobody's business. Uh, yeah. But so there's a mix. And like Thank some you. of my secret ones are, you know, here are the people that I absolutely must read. And uh, maybe I should make that one public. And you're on that list, for example. And oh. I look at that list. And if somebody has posted anything on that list, I'm going to read it. And so that is people like you that I definitely could, I see as a serving as a great curation and filter. Yeah, well, and, and it, it goes back to your original question of how do average people take control of the tidal wave of information that's available? And um, yeah, some, some digital channels offer those kinds of tools. Yeah. Um, so thanks. Thanks for both of those. I think uh, the, the digital um, um, panels like this Stanford event, uh, which I'm going to look for myself and try to attend, and the use of Twitter in that way, I think is very important. In fact, I'd say I was given more insights on the coming pandemic from following people on Twitter than from any media source. And then as things started to develop, I was given more insights on what we should do about it than even the CDC. Uh, so it's very important that you find trusted people to follow and engage with. I'll, I'll point out one other um, analogous uh, environment, and that's LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn, uh, so I was uh, still with Microsoft Research when Microsoft acquired LinkedIn. And I thought it was a great, brilliant, inspired move. And one of the things that uh, I liked that I heard at the beginning and that they've lived up to is Microsoft said, we're not going to monkey around with, uh, we're not going to um, screw up what really works with LinkedIn. And I think they've very much uh, lived up to that. It's still basically run as its own company. It's a, a great service. And there have been some integrations, uh, you know, between the, the series of Microsoft services and so forth. But, but as an environment, one of the great things about uh, LinkedIn is uh, that uh, you have very easy, quick access for uh, authentication and validation of who's posting what you're looking at, what's their background. And uh, it's a, you know, you wind up becoming very nimble as, as, as nimble as an HR professional 
at assessing the credibility of people based on their kind of track record background and, uh, and online resume. And that really helps with the volume of information that's presented in LinkedIn. And uh, it's a great source because people tend, as you know, people tend to be a little bit more professional uh, about what they're posting and commenting on, not always, but usually. And so that, especially in this period where everybody's working remotely, uh, by and large, I noticed that the, the volume of uh, posting on LinkedIn has really grown. I think people are trying to be as professional in the online realm as they can, and that, that highlights the, uh, the value of LinkedIn. All right. Lewis, I want to transition and ask a few more questions about technology. And, um, you know, I've always appreciated your views on technology and where it's going and what it can do. In fact, for the last almost uh, eight or nine years now, I've been running the CTO Vision blog where I write uh, personally about technology and have other analysts helping me write there too. And um, I was wondering if you remember who named that blog for me, CTO Vision. Is that a, a memory that you have? No. I'll tell you, it was you, Lewis. I was uh, reviewing with you several ideas and the fact that you were already writing, you, you still have a blog that you maintain periodically. <clears throat> and I was uh, doing a bit of writing here and there and wanted to bring it all together in one location. And uh, you suggested the name CTO Vision and I grabbed it. And it's, uh, I wanted to start off the conversation by saying, I appreciate that, Lewis. Is there an account where all those royalties are piling up somewhere or? <laughs> That's they... right. That's right. Happy to help. Happy yeah. to help. <laughs> Thanks, Lewis. I appreciate it. And we look forward to continuing the discussion with part two of this UDACast. Great. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.